This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Um, one slight correction, we are no longer Microsoft Research, we're now part of Azure. So we're actually in the engineering part of the group. And I officially, the Microsoft Quantum Architect, that's the title of this presentation we do. Maybe I'll get a little bit to what that is at the end, but this is kind of an overview of everything that we do and um, why our efforts are a little different than everybody else's and what we're trying to achieve. And, you know, quantum computing's gotten a lot of press lately, and that's good, it's bad. Uh, the bad side of it is I get the pointy haired boss in my office literally every day. Well, do we have it? Do we have it? Do we have, do we have control? Can we do readout? How are we doing compared to the competition? Um, on the other hand, all that attention means PR is interested in us, and corporate marketing is interested. So we get all sorts of support like this. talk about quantum computing, it's a completely different game. Quantum computing will enable us to solve problems that currently take longer than the lifetime of the universe in seconds, hours, or days. We completely reconceive the space in which we do computation. Quantum computing is like going from crawling to going to a different planet. It's different. It's only natural that we would want to use the world's most powerful device to combat the world's most challenging problems. We can attack global warming. Security. What are the boundaries of machine learning? Finding diseases. The possibilities of quantum computers are endless. Microsoft has the best and the brightest working on this problem. It's really happening. Progress is very fast, and we're building a quantum computer. What the world wants to know is what happens when we turn the machine off. What problems will be solvable with a computer that computes in a billion parallel universes at the same time? Okay, everybody suitably jazzed at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are really talking about a paradigm shift. We're talking about taking the way we've been doing math and computation for thousands of years and changing how we do it. And it's really at the very most fundamental levels that this happens. So we build machines today. We say we have parallel processing. No, we don't. We have copies of the hardware doing the same thing serially that we program in a parallel way or distributed way. Everything we do is still take one register, take another register, add it together, send it out. This is how all computation runs today. Exponential, depending on the algorithm, come from. But there's more than that. Part of the reason it's so parallel is you can store data extremely compressed. So the number of qubits you need to represent a lot of data is very small. In fact, it's very quickly you get to the number of qubits that is just a handful and you, you reach numbers you can't even conceive. So this is awesome. This means I can put lots of data into the machine. It means I can operate on it, all of it at the same time. Gee, we should be able to do everything with it. Well, some things we can't do. Factoring is one of the oldest quantum algorithms that's been around, this is Shor's algorithm. And if you think about it, if I can put all the numbers in and try them all at once, I can just do brute force. And so something that would take, say, a billion years on state-of-the-art classical machines today, estimates for a reasonable quantum computer about 100 seconds to do the same thing. This is good. You know, there's, there's some things here that we can actually do. This is an example of where we spend most of our time on leadership class machines. So big supercomputers, we spend a lot of time doing chemistry. 
we do material sciences, lots of simulations. And as long as the molecules are made from atoms in the first two rows of the periodic table, there's no problem because those look like normal orbitals. You know, S and P orbitals are spherical. They stay away from each other. They're isolated and local. As soon as we get further down in the periodic table, we have D and F orbitals. These things zoom in and out to the nucleus all the way out across all the other orbitals. You can't do it. You can't even hold the state in a plasma machine. So you can't get any good accuracy. You can't design pharmaceuticals. You can't, do, I mean, just go down the list, high temperature superconductors, all sorts of things, because you can't even represent the state, let alone compute on it. This little molecule I have up here, Efimoco, we'll come back to, as it turns out that's one of the um, first class problems I'd like to solve. I'd like to explain what that is and what it's for. But when you look at the scaling of all of this, we go on a classical machine, what you'll see is for small molecules, it's very tractable. But as we go up, there's this exponential slowdown. Because again, you have an exponential explosion of how all the electrons can interact with each other. And what that means is, even if I look 50 years out, 100 years out on where classical might go, even if Moore's law doesn't slow down, it doesn't move very much. You are never going to solve those molecules or those uh, materials that we care about. On the other hand, you look at the scaling for quantum computing, and this looks tractable. It looks like there's all sorts of things we can do that we could never do classically. So all of this is about motivation, why at least I'm in this field to try to make it work. So let's talk a little about what are we really doing here? What is classical versus quantum computing? Um, we're all happy with bits. You turn them on, you turn them off, you're zero, you're one. And people like to say a quantum bit or a qubit is both zero and one. Well, it's a lot more than that. If you look at the numbers up there, um, this is an alpha and a beta that multiply the two values of zero and one. And the two values of zero and one um, are being multiplied by a complex number. So you're really in a four-dimensional space because you've got two degrees of freedom on each. The Alpha squared plus the beta squared always equals one. So you're on the surface of this four-dimensional sphere. And you can store a lot of information in just one qubit. There's a lot you can do there with both the magnitude and the phase. When we build classical machines, we have logic gates. You have a not gate, you put a value in one end, it flips it, flips the bit, pulls it out the other end. Quantum is actually the same, it's just we use arrays to describe all our gates. So in this case, my alpha and beta are multiplied by a matrix and they become beta and alpha. I've done a not gate. I flip the meaning of zero and one. And we have equivalent gates all the way through. One difference is when we get to bigger gates, we tend to use truth tables, like this is an XOR gate. We can just say, given what A and B are, what is the output? Quantum site, we still just have a matrix. And even though it doesn't look like it, this controlled not gate is an XOR gate. The logic is the same, except you can have combinations of 0, 1 going through this, because it's just linear algebra. You're multiplying a matrix times a vector, and that's all the system does over and over and over. There are differences, like when we build a system, our gates go in one direction. We put them on a paper, we draw them left to right, we wire them up that way, there's inputs and there's outputs. But we've got matrices. They go both ways. And in fact, on a quantum machine, if I do everything quantum in a quantum mode, I can start from where I begin, go all the way through, and I can compute all the way backwards. I can put the output in and come all the way back to the beginning, guaranteed, because that's all we're doing. Now we get into some of the problems. Okay, so the first problem is we always make temporary copies. You, know, you take something, you make a copy, you try something on it, you throw it away, you make another copy. This is how we do machine learning, this is how we do optimization, how we do search, all of that. You can't do any of that on a quantum machine. As soon as you make a copy, they're linked forever. You touch any one of a thousand copies, they all change together. So now you can't do just temporary computations and throw them away. Remember, this is linear algebra. There's no way to get rid of information as you're multiplying these things through. Well, that's a little bit of a problem. What it means is programming is very different. There's a whole shift in how you do the programming. You still write software, you do all the same, there's algorithms but they have restrictions on them that are different and then they have benefits that are different and you have to learn to program them. We'll talk about that near the end. Noise, there's always noise. <clears throat> things go wrong, things break, or there's just mistakes, things are at small margins. We put parity bits on memory, we put Hamming codes on things so we can fix bits that are bad. We can do the same thing quantum, but it's much tougher. Okay, the problem is 
the qubit has all of this information, not just this one bit, and we have to fix all of it. And so it turns out the overhead of how many physical qubits do I need to make one that's perfect, a logical qubit. Something like a logical bit is perfect, but we make it out of transistors and have to fix it. Here, it can be hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of physical qubits to make one that's actually good. And we'll talk about that a little more too. Storage. If I've got a 32-bit register, I can hold one number from zero to four billion. Makes sense, now two to the n minus one. If I have 32 qubits, I can hold 4 billion numbers. That's the difference. So instead of having one number in 2 to the n minus 1, I've got 2 to the n minus 1 numbers. Each is 2 to the n minus 1 in value range. So this is this massive compression. Well, if that's what my storage looks like, when I do an ALU or I do an arithmetic logic unit on the classical side, I'll take a 32-bit number and a 32-bit number and add them together and get a 32-bit number. If I take a 32 qubit register and a 32 qubit register and add it together, I get 4 billion additions happened at once. And this is where all that massive speed up and all that compression comes from. Classical input and output is linear. If I want to page rank the internet, I got to load the pages. It's linear. I got to get the data in. I compute and then I look at the outputs and I can pull them out one at a time. I mean, that doesn't sound like you do much worse than that. Yes, you can. Quantum, the input's about the same. You have to load everything, and loading costs about the same. But when you go to get a value out, remember we have those 32-bit qubit register, and I'm going to now read the value. I get one of those 4 billion values out. I don't get all 4 billion. And as soon as I get that one, remember it's reversible, I just destroyed the whole rest of the machine. So if I want a page rank, I can put the web in, I go all the way through, I get one answer, which page we landed on this time. And by getting that, I destroyed it. I could load the whole web again over and over and over exponentially to sample to get the output. You've just gotten rid of any exponential benefit you had of the computation because of all the data you had to load and how you get it out. So you have to design your algorithms differently. You have to design them so that a small answer or a very um, precious answer can be gotten out where I don't care about getting mass quantities of data out because I can't do it. I get classical data in the end. I put classical data in at the beginning, I get classical at the end, but the computation is exponentially fast once. And every time I have to repeat it, it costs me. So we've been talking about qubits, but we haven't talked about physical qubits really. And there's two axes here that we have to worry about. There are classes of qubits that scale well in terms of just the number of qubits. I can use normal integrated circuit manufacturing techniques. I can put hundreds, thousands, millions of qubits on a chain. Qubits that we're building, a million will fit on a two inch wafer. No problem. But everyone else who's doing this, so this is IBM, Intel, Google, um, uh, Rigetti, a bunch of others, are doing a type of qubit that scales extremely well. They're silicon qubits, they're easy to make. You can make them um, with standard techniques and mostly standard materials, but they have extremely high error rates. What that means is I need 1,000 to 10,000 physical qubits to get one good one that I can keep alive. On the other hand, there are techniques that will give you good scaling in error rates. I can get the errors way, 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 way down. So the physical qubit is almost the logical qubit. Awesome, but I can only make 10 of them. They don't scale out. I can't make millions. They're like optical techniques, ion traps, things like that, where I have lasers work that I'm actually hitting points with, and it's you can't go beyond a certain size. It just physically doesn't scale. What we're trying to do is the best of both, of course. This is this topological quantum computing, which we'll give you some detail next on what that is. But we're the only ones really doing this, especially at the commercial level. There is research at universities. We tend to sponsor most of it, to be honest. <laughs> There was a time uh, when the newspaper said that only 12 men understood the theory of relativity. I don't believe there ever was such a time. There might have been a time when only one man did, because he's the only guy who caught on but he, before he wrote his paper. But after people read it, a lot of people kind of understood the theory of relativity in some way or other. But more than 12. On the other hand, I think I can safely say that uh, nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like, and if you will simply admit that maybe she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful 
and transcend faith. So, if you bear with me and take the words of Dr. Feynman, um, we're going to explain how this actually works, even though it doesn't really make a lot of sense from a common sense point of view, what you see in every day. We're going to start with an Italian physicist named Etoire Majorana, um, 1930s. Uh, if you're interested in good murder mysteries and all sorts of uh, stories, this is a, he's a good guy to look up. He wrote this theory of um, topological uh, systems, which I'll, I'll talk about now, but he, he published a monograph and then disappeared, got on a ferry and was never seen again. And there's been all sorts of hunts for what happened to Majorana. I think they finally figured it out. He wound up in South America somewhere. There's all sorts of things, but there's been plays about it. This is one of these big mysteries of science. So just interesting character. But he had a weird um, goal. And the goal was, can I do quantum mechanics without complex numbers? He didn't like complex numbers. And he actually showed in this monograph he could solve Schrodinger's wave equation without complex numbers. But he did a trick. And the trick was, okay, the electron has a real part, imaginary part. Of, well, let's just split it apart. Let's just use real numbers, but we'll make the electron in two pieces. And this is what a Majorana on a Fermi on it. We fractionalize the electron, we split it in half. There is no such thing in nature. Um, actually, that's not true. I'll fix that in a second. But as far as we know, there's no such thing in nature. Um, but if I do this, I don't need complex numbers, which is the goal of my life. Okay. Um, this was about 1937 when he did this. In the late 90s, Alexei Kataev uh, figured out that, you know, if you had these particles and you move them around each other, you could compute. And he showed how you could do quantum computing with these particles if you had them. Okay. Around 2000, he and Michael Friedman came to Microsoft. Uh, Michael is a Fields Medalist, by the way, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in math. And he's the only one working in the industry. And he works in our group. Um, and they came up with a complete theory of computation. Now, Michael is a um, uh, algebraic topologist, and this therefore topological states of matter are interesting to him. And why is this a topological state of matter? But as part of this, Craig Mundy, who some of you may remember um, from Microsoft, with Michael started Station Q in 2006 with the goal of building a scalable quantum computer. So this is how long we've officially been going after this. And in 2012, we had the cover of Science Magazine where we actually made Myron fermions in the lab for the first time. So this theoretical abstract particle now exists. The side note I'll say is now that the Large Hadron Collider has found the Higgs boson, they're looking for actual real Myron fermions in nature because they think that's what makes up neutrinos. Um, the bad side of it, it turns out, even if they find them, they can't be used for quantum computing because they're a bailing and the statistics they have will not let you compute. Um, whole talk on a bailing, not a bailing anions. We'll do that some other time if someone's interested. But um, we made quasi particles. The thing you do in condensed matter physics is you make things that act like what you're looking for, but they're not really that. When we do solid state electronics, we talk about having electrons going in one direction, holes going in the other direction. There's no such thing as holes, but it helps you do the math. And it's correct in terms of mathematically, but there are no particles that are holes. Okay. Same thing uh, in crystal lattices. We have things called phonons, which are acoustic waves that go through lattices. No, there's no particle that's a phonon. But condensed matter physicists have gotten really good at coming up with things that act like that's what this, what's there, even though it's not physically there. It describes what's happening physically in the system. So we make Majorana quasi particles. They're not Majorana's. They're not physical electrons that are split in half, but they act like they do. And they meet all the requirements. And we'll show what that looks like now. So I was going to say just 20, 2018, where we are now, we've gotten to the point where, well, we've demonstrated Majoranas. We've built this whole team up. It's time to actually build systems. And that's where we are today. So this electron fractionalization can break electrons in half. Well, sort of. Here's what we're going to do. We take a nanowire. We can take a wire that we manufacture that will only allow a single bucket brigade of electrons down the wire, okay? one channel open. And since electrons allow two to be in the same place, if one spin up and spin down, you naturally get 
these electrons spin up and spin down, pairing together, going down the wire. Each one, and remember, each electron has a real part and imaginary part. Now, if I make this out of superconducting material, then the spin ups and spin downs pair together. The electrons act like bosons, and you get superconductivity. No resistance. They are basically photons made out of two electrons. This is where you see all the maglev trains and MRIs, everything that has superconducting hardware. This is what the electrons do that make them superconducting. What we do is we use specialized materials, high magnetic fields, um, various mixtures, and we get them to pair slightly different. They still look the same, but you'll notice at the end of the wire, there's a real part and imaginary part left over. They're not in with any of the other pairs. You basically have an electron that's been split to each end of the wire. There's your wire on the front of the box. Now, why do I care? The bane of quantum computing is noise. Okay, qubits equal here. This is Schrodinger's cat. You look at the cat by opening the box, and the cat is either alive or dead. Well, it's not you looking at the cat. It's anything in the universe interacting with the cat. That's why it's not really a great example. But what it means is if another particle, a cosmic ray, comes in and hits your qubit, it's been measured, it's been seen, and it falls apart. It goes, goes classical, it becomes zero or one instead of both. Noise is anything that can interact with it, and temperature is the worst thing. As you come up, everything starts moving, everything jumps around. This is why we have to do things very cold. But even cold, like I said, cosmic rays come in. By the way, that's memory failures in classical machines. We get that sort of thing. But this is much worse, much harder to keep out. We actually use the same stuff NASA does, EcoSorb, to keep out as much radiation as possible. We do this in high vacuum and very cold. But that's because I got a qubit sitting up. Everybody's qubits are made out of a quantum state. And you can make any quantum state. I can use polarization. I can use energy level. I can use occupancy. I can use frequency. I can on and on and on. All, anything that is definable with a quantum number can be used to make a qubit. The problem is they're all local. They're things that when you hit them, you've measured them. But here, we've got the same electron, but he's separated in space so that if something hits this guy, he doesn't hit this guy. Now he survives. So let's say we use four of them instead of two of them. We redundantly encode our information, and no matter which one gets hit, we still have enough information to recover. That qubit stays alive for long periods of time. So this topological effect, when you think of it like the difference of writing with chalk on a board or knots on a string, a rainstorm comes up, the chalk's gone, but the knots are just fine. You haven't lost your numbers. You need a non-local effect. You have to untie the string to get rid of the knot. Anything local to it won't change it. And that's really the crux of what we do. What does it mean? Well, our qubits will probably last on the order of a minute. I mean, I've seen, we've had materials that we've kept alive 56 seconds, but when you actually make it a qubit, let's just say a minute. It's a nice round number. The longest lived qubit of the type that all those competitors are doing is about 50 microseconds. D Wave's machine, the one that has 2,000 qubits in it, they last about 10 nanoseconds. And there isn't a path to get up from that 50 microseconds for. I mean, it's really at the edge, or they've been at it for 20 years at this point, actually 30 years at this point. So, for them to build a logical qubit, they need 10,000 of them to keep one alive. So when I tell you a typical quantum computing solution for a real-world problem is about 200 qubits. Now, people love to say, look, you only need 200 qubits. That's 200 logical qubits, perfect qubits. They need 2 million to actually do the 200. We need about 2,000 or to 20 times. Now you have a chance to build a scalable machine. You don't need a lot of physical qubits to actually pull off real world solutions. However, there's two problems. There's two things our qubits won't do that theirs do, and we have to fix this. First problem is these Majorana and fermions, when you do the math, are their own antiparticle. If they get near each other, they, they basically combine and go back to the vacuum, they're gone. They annihilate each other. Well, that means braiding is really hard to do. <laughs> Try to move around each other, and they're going to kill each other. So we're going to take a trip from the British Armada in 1588, when they fought the Spanish and won, because the Spanish believed you couldn't sail into the wind. 
it was against God and nature. And the British said, uh, no, actually, as long as you can measure a vector, in this case the wind, in two directions, you can actually rotate it to any angle you want. It gets shorter, but you get to go in that direction. So by having a keel and a sail, a sailboat can sail right into the wind. It means that measurement is the same thing as doing a rotation, which is what a gate is, a quantum gate is a rotation. So if we just measure correctly, we can do all the operations we need to do, and that's exactly what we do. So in this paper, we did, by the way, this is a great paper uh, for people if they see what we're recording. Um, this kind of lays out the whole process, what you need to do. But our qubits look like H's on their sides, and the red dots are the Majoranas. And now when I measure any pair of them, I'm measuring an axis, X, Y, and Z. <coughs> I said there were two problems. So the first one, okay, we know how to compute with them, but it turns out we're missing a gate. Through those measurements and through these types of particles, we're missing something that makes us Turing complete. So it's kind of useless for computation unless we can do full computation. What we need is a pi over eight gate, or it's also known as a T gate. Well, there's a technique, this is a, a drawing of a circuit for an algorithm where the blue boxes are approximate T. So let's say I can rotate something to near pi over 8, and I get a bunch of them. If I take 15 of them, put them through this circuit, I get one out that's cubically better. I do it again, I get another cubic uh, increase. And actually, there are other circuits that give you all sorts of different orders of magnitude. But it means we can, we can take approximate gates, and we know how to make the approximate ones, and generate good ones out of them. So a lot of our machine will be taken up doing this sort of work, but it means we have a way to do it, make it turn complete, and actually do the computations. So if we take this, run it through a compiler, out, have it output its drawing instead of the hand-drawn ones, you see that it works. Then we're going to convert all those gates to measurements like we had on the previous slide. And then we're going to take all of those measurements and apply them to actual hardware simulations of things we build in the lab. That's an actual scanning electron micrograph of the thing in the paper that's the middle one on the left. And what we get is that algorithm running in various different geometries with different quality qubits, with different quality angles, and we can then predict exactly what we need, how we need to build this. So we're building this full stack, all the way from the algorithm at the top, all the way down to that hardware at the bottom. So we're really at that point, I said in the 2018, where it's time to build something. Let's actually go make a system. And we're, I think, the only ones really doing the full stack. I mean, we do everything from Again, the algorithms on the top, languages, runtimes, all the way down into now the qubits, into the measurement and the readout classical hardware that's needed, the fridges themselves, the materials. We have to grow our own materials. We have to build everything end to end. So it's more like a NASA project than anything else. We have to do every bit of it. And we actually have a side shoot off of this. When you have to think of a different way to program something, you think about the problem differently. So let's say we go after machine learning or any other optimization problem, but now we have all these different restrictions. It has to be reversible. We can't make temporary copies. How do you, so how do you solve them? When you get that, sometimes you bring it back to classical and you have a new way to solve the problem classical. And that's what we're doing in Azure. So we actually have a partner program where we're working with companies that have various optimization problems and other types of problems that we can actually do better than the normal machine learning because we're using something different, we're coming from a completely different approach. We're actually simulating the quantum computer on Azure and running that. It's nowhere near as good as the quantum computer would be, but it's better than what everyone's currently doing classically in certain areas. And this is what the quantum inspired or quantum ready for Microsoft Azure is. And then we're doing lots of work. We're doing community growth and so forth, which I'll show in a second. So there are three broad levels of abstraction. The algorithms at the top, we've got the actual runtime and the machine code, if you will, in the middle, and then you've got the actual hardware at the bottom. So let's focus a little bit at the top on the, the compiler, the language. We've come out with a new language, Q Sharp. It's a fully supported Microsoft language. It's fully integrated with Visual Studio and the debuggers. It runs on VS Code. It's multi-platform. Uh, it's free, by the way. Uh, and actually, all the libraries, a lot of the work we do over there is open source. So we have a big community we're building to pull all this together. There's a lot of libraries. And then we have simulators that run both locally on your machine. And then we need more qubits out to the cloud. 
if you think about it, a, a 32 gigabyte laptop, I can do 30 qubits pretty comfortably. But every time you add a qubit, I need to double the memory and double the runtime. Okay, we go out to Azure. I've got thousands of machines. How many qubits can I do? Low 40s. Don't even go that, up that much from 30. And you can't go further. You know, if I wanted to do 50 qubits, I need a pedestore and a ridiculous number of machines, and it'll take forever to run anyway. So there's no point. <clears throat> this, if, if, there, if you could do it, then I would need the quantum computer, so it's okay. But there is this hard limit that comes very quickly, which means what you can do at home on your own machine is pretty much what anyone can do anywhere in the world. So that's also kind of cool. The community is actually able to build a lot of things that they don't need special resources. You know, you've got a nice, reasonable workstation or laptop, you can do it yourself. So let's walk through a complete example. This is the quantum hello world. This is teleport. This is the same thing. And what this is, is I have a message that I want to send to someone who's far away. That's all this is about. Except, quantumly, you'll see, we can do this instantly. But we don't violate relativity. I'll show you where at the end. So, Alice and Bob are the two people who want to exchange a message. They don't know what the message is yet. We each have a qubit. So that one and zero that you see is the state of each of their qubit, where this is how much is in zero, how much is in one. So 100% of them are zero. They're both the zero values. And if you want to combine them, you just multiply together, you'll get zero, zero, both qubits being zero is one, and zero, one, one, zero, one, one have no probability of happening. Okay? So that's all we did. We multiplied the two qubits together, so we just hold them in one register. So a Hadamard gate takes a qubit, that's zero, and flips it on its side so it has a 50-50 probability of being zero or one. So we multiply it by a matrix, and what we get is that zero, zero is now half of the probability, and zero, one, excuse me, one, zero is half the probability, because that first qubit could be zero or one with 50-50 probability, and the other qubit is still zero. And so that's why there's two states there, that when we flipped it, one of the qubits now is 50-50, and the other qubit is still zero. The square root of two is because everything has to be squared. These are actually magnitudes. They can go negative. They're not really probabilities. When you square them, they become probabilities. So you multiply it out, you get a one half for each one of them, and there's your probability that falls on. Details. Controlled not gate. So this is our XOR that we had earlier. We multiply them out, and now look at the probabilities. Zero, zero is 50%, and one, one is 50%. What that means is if I take these two qubits and go to opposite sides of the universe. I can't tell you what the values are going to be, 50-50. But if either of us measure the qubit, we're going to get a zero or a one. The other side of the universe is going to see the same measurement when they measure it. They will both be zero or they will both be one. That's entanglement. Now, you go, wait a minute, didn't that happen instantaneously across the universe? Haven't we broken relativity? No, because there's no way to exchange that information faster than the speed of light. And you'll see to actually send a message, which we haven't done yet, there's a limit that's the speed of light. And that happens later here in this very simple circuit. So these are entangled. Entanglement is a really weird thing. This is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. Um, but yeah, it works. And it's been proven also physically. The, um, the loophole-free Bell tests that were done at CERN and, and um, in various other places, we do it at NIST here in uh, in Colorado, where we've actually sent messages and proven that they're entangled, and we get answers you can't get from classical probability. Anyway, so now we have our message. Our message has A in zero, B in one. This is the thing we want to send through. So Alice entangles it with a C naught, does a fix up with the Hadamard, and now the vector has all the information in it, but you have no idea what you're going to get when you measure it. When you measure it, you could get A, B, you get B, A. You get minus A, B, minus B, A. There's all sorts of possibilities here of what you might get out when you did that measurement, because there's a 50-50 probability across the whole thing. Oops. We need to send ancillary information to tell the person at the other end how to fix the qubit up to get the desired answer. And so what we do, Alice measures her two qubits, the one that had the message and the one that she had entangled with Bob. And she gets out two classical bits. That's all. But the two bits say, I need to flip one axis one way, I need to flip the other axis the other way. And it tells you what you need to do. She now has to transmit that to Bob. There's your speed of light. 
Those two bits can't get the ball faster than the speed of light because they're classical. When they get there, he applies the gate, and lo and behold, AB falls out, and he gets his message. So we can teleport. We can do this across the universe, but it's still no faster than the speed of light because information can't fa happen that fast. Now, the question is, did they actually flip state instantaneously across the universe, or was it when they, that's a philosophical question. There's all sorts of arguments on both sides. But the only restriction here was the information can't go faster than the speed of light. So that's our hello world. That's teleport. By the way, if you build a simulator, this works, you build it right. This is actually very hard to get right from someone who's built a lot of quantum simulators. But all we did was linear algebra. We just multiply vectors and matrices together, and that's all we do on a quantum computer. There's nothing more than that. So here's that same circuit, and here's the Q-sharp code that generates it. We can allocate uh, values or qubits just like we allocate registers. Uh, classically, we can apply gates, they're just procedures from our point of view, but the system knows what's quantum and what's classical and how to integrate the two and keeps, does all the bookkeeping, keeps track of it, hides all the stuff behind that it just looks like a normal programming language. I do a control knot, I do another control knot, I do the Hadamard. This line is kind of interesting. I do a quantum measurement on a on a qubit, which gives me a classical result, and then do a classical if and apply a quantum valve, quantum gate to it based on that. So again, I can just seamlessly integrate as I go, do the same here, and that was the whole algorithm. So what's kind of cool about this is it's a very functionally flavored language. It's easy to use. Um, the quantum specific features are there. It actually understands that you've used a qubit that's dirty and how it has to be returned back. It, in effect garbage collection, but quantumly figures out what, what needs to happen to it before you can use it again, states that things are in. All the control um, on the classical side is integrated in, and we built a giant library of all sorts of algorithm areas and all sorts of support code you can use. We've also come out, I think now we're on our third or fourth release of the quantum development kit. And the latest release, which came out this week, um, has a new chemical simulation library. We do all sorts of molecules with it now. Um, the language itself has gotten easier and easier to use. We've added from user feedback things that people wanted in the language, and there's a whole uh, improved developer experience to it. Just a screenshot to show this is Visual Studio Code running on a Mac, running that teleport algorithm with a simulator under it. We're agnostic. It runs on everything. Uh, it even runs uh, under Python, say in Jupyter Notebooks. So if you wanted to do a a lab notebook and you wanted to have the quantum simulation underneath in the Q-sharp language and you put Python on top of it, party on. It's just a Microsoft language and everything links together. It doesn't care. Um, we're building a fairly extensive developer community at this point. We, we found a really great group of people out there. What we didn't realize, we when we said, okay, we'll build this quantum development kit, we figured, yeah, get a thousand downloads. We've had more downloads than all the ML kits that have been put on Azure. Okay, it's just been this massive explosion, and then this feedback. We've run a couple of contests, and it's just been ridiculous the, the response. I'm, I'm thrilled, but I didn't think that many people are actually doing quantum programming. Apparently, they are. Um, if you're interested, another nice piece of this uh, this is due to Maria and the group. She came up with this idea of katas. So, these katas are self paced tutorials that you can sit there and walk through all of these different areas in quantum algorithms, and each one has problems you have to solve. They're puzzles. And write code to do this, right? and it checks your code, makes sure it's the right thing goes on to the next. And you can walk through this and learn how to program all of this stuff on your own pretty easily. I'm going to jump now up to algorithms, just for a little bit, and just talk about real hardware and real, soft, real, real systems. So this little five qubit algorithm, the way the way these circuits are written, the lines like staffs and musical lines are the qubits, and time is going left to right, and you're just operating on them as you go across. So we start it in zero, we do some work, and we measure it at the end. This is the core of a what's called a hidden shift algorithm, which is part of elliptic cryptography. So we've got a lot of people who work in cryptography. This is the very, very core of the next generation of cryptography, which is called elliptic. And we can take that algorithm, compile it through our software, and then run it on the IBM quantum experience. We can run it on the University of Maryland ion trap. And so you can sit there onto real hardware and then 
get statistics out and see how well the various pieces of hardware do. So we can do benchmarking and tomography of actual pieces of hardware along the way. My area happens to be quantum chemistry. It's what I was doing in research along the way. And we wrote four papers over a year in trying to figure out what does it really take to do chemistry on a quantum computer. And when we started, we took a look at this molecule, ferrodoxin, Fe2S2. It's cute because it's only got four atoms, you know, two irons and, and two sulfurs. And it's in everybody's bloodstream. It's in every plant. It's like the heart of photosynthesis. It's this little molecule that has four pigtails on it. It's an energy transport molecule. It can pick up other ones and move them around. And it's really important. Cannot be computed to any degree of accuracy on a classical machine because of the iron. Iron has d orbitals again, they're non local. You can't get any sort of accuracy on a classical machine, biggest in the world. So, how long will it take on a quantum computer? We did some reasonable numbers, and before we started, we took a look at it, and it came out at 24 billion years on a quantum computer. Well, it's not lifetime in the universe, that's good, <laughs> but it's not much better. End of the first paper, we were down to 850,000 years, oh, a little better. Second paper, we're down to 30 years. Now we're in human lifetime. This is getting better, but I still can't sell a computer that I have to wait 30 years for every answer. Um, I'm not going to call it deep thought. <laughs> so the third paper, we got it down to five days. Okay, now we're cooking with gas. There's lots of things that take five days to compute scientifically, but the fourth paper, we got it down to an hour. Now, that's kind of a ridiculous reduction. And the question is, how did we get there? Because that doesn't, you know, from the end of the 11th down to end of the third scaling, is that doesn't happen. So how did it happen? Well, I said I can simulate molecules. I can only simulate very small molecules, and we'll go up to 30 qubits or so. But I can do some, you know, reasonably reasonable molecules that are small. And when you looked at what people had said it would take to do this, the blue line on top was that 24 billion years to, to compute uh, ferrodoxin out on the end. And then at the end of our first paper and our second paper, we're doing the standard computer science things. Let's cancel out redundancies. Let's figure out things that really don't need to be computed. Let's make the algorithms more efficient and on and on. And we got a pretty sizable reduction. But while this was going on, I'm doing simulations of these smaller molecules, and they're way down on a different scale. They don't even look like what we're seeing. So then we go back to the theoreticians and say, uh, What's up? Oh, you're doing it wrong. Do this molecule. Do it. No, it's still on that line. It's still on that line. And it turns out no one ever made them make tight assumptions. Everything they made were, well, orders of magnitude of how long things, no, no, how long will it really take to do this? What do the errors really look like? What does the scaling of the terms really look like? No, they're not all the same magnitude. They have a, a uh, log tail fall off, you know, the usual types of things you'd expect. The errors tend to cancel. They're not all positive, but they did worst case for everything. So we start plugging in the real numbers, and by the third paper, we've got it down to the yellow line. In the fourth paper, we're exactly where the simulation says it should be. So we have belief that A, the simulations are actually right. B, we've figured out how nature, nature is much more efficient than the mathematicians want to let her be. And you say, you know, you know, everything has symmetries, and it, nature takes advantage of the symmetries. You can't just throw them away. And so now we get down to that one hour. More interestingly, that Fe moco molecule I had at the beginning, this is also known as nitrogenase, um, which has six irons and a molybdenum in it, you'll never compute this thing on a classical machine, is at the center of nitrogen fixation. This is called making fertilizer. So we know there's an anaerobic bacteria in the root of all the plants around the world that takes the nitrogen out of the atmosphere, breaks the triple bond at room temperature, room pressure, and makes ammonia, makes fertilizer. We can't do it. We use a process from the early 1900s called the Haber-Bosch process, which eats three to five percent of the energy output of the planet per year. It's I'm sorry, three percent. The five percent is is the natural gas, the amount of natural gas that we eat every year, just to make fertilizer. It makes it too expensive for third world countries and developing nations to plant many years because they can't afford the fertilizer. Well, we know there's this little bacteria who does this every day at room temperature, room pressure, no energy, and does it. But we can't analyze it. This is the guy I want to go after on the quantum chemistry side with a quantum computer immediately. This is as soon as I have enough qubits, this is what I go after. Because this will feed the world. 
You know, this is simple. By the way, same class of problems, same number of qubits. I can make a paint that absorbs carbon out of the air. You just solve global warming, paint everything with it. So we've got a number of these applications that say, you know, it doesn't have to go too far. 200 logical qubits or so, and you can do all of this. I mentioned bringing this stuff back to classical, like on Azure. So solving hard optimization problems is a good example of where we've done that with partners. I think I have a video. Yeah, I haven't done this before. Let's see how this works. Modern healthcare today is really based on imaging. In the area of MRI scanners, we've developed a technology here called magnetic resonance fingerprinting that really allows us to take a quantitative picture of the patient's body. Microsoft is providing optimized quantum inspired algorithms to really solve our hard problems, using them to make MRI faster, cheaper, and more efficient to help people all over the world with this technology. Microsoft and Case Western Reserve are working together to push the forefront of healthcare technology using algorithms that look at the world in a quantum way. We can go much, much faster than any classical algorithm that's been out there to date. These quantum inspired algorithms are giving us a window into a future that we just didn't think about before. And we want to use that power to find diagnoses and treatments that mankind just has not been able to come up with yet. Quantum computing is going to allow us to solve problems that we never thought we could. This quantum type thinking is going to open new doors that we haven't had before. These quantum computers will be in our Azure data center. This is the ultimate intelligent cloud. We are going to be able to make profound impacts in the world with quantum computing, whether it's healthcare, whether it's climate change, whether it's food production. And I just can't wait to see the impact that this is going to make on people's lives. So there's a lot of stuff happening now. There's a lot of stuff that's on its way, a lot of stuff for the future. Um, but like I said, the nitrogen fixation, the carbon capture are all about the same scale problem. Material science is actually easier. So you want room temperature superconductors, you want lossless power lines, you want batteries. For instance, we know of at least a few hundred organic, mostly organic based materials that will hold a voltage. We have to today test each one in the lab. You have to make it and try it. We know there's something out there that I can make a soup that I fill a swimming pool with and I have a battery for a solar farm. I can also get rid of the heavy metals that we use in a lot of the batteries for the same types of things on and on. We know it's out there. We just have no way to get to it now. On a quantum computer, I can simulate all of those extremely fast and just find the right guy. There's lots of stuff I have to do in a lab today. Instead, I could do it if the simulations were good enough. The machine learning, I work for Microsoft, they want machine learning, okay? If you ask me, this is not where I'm going to focus on computers. Like <laughs> photography is not where I'm going to focus on computers. The problem with machine learning is the amount of data. We're back to that problem of getting the information out is hard. You gotta load all of it anyway, and there's all of these other things that have to happen where we're really good classically at doing machine learning. Now there are cases I can show where quantum machine learning does exceed or does excel over classical, but it's more a matter of flavor, not things we can't do. I'd rather go after things we can't do. I'd rather find things that if I get it, we want. It's one of those things that you know we want that answer versus, oh, I can give you a little bit better you know, cost function in the machine learning algorithm. Maybe yes, maybe no. But we are working on machine learning. It does take a lot more qubits, probably more in the order of 1,000 to 2,000 logical qubits as opposed to a couple hundred logical qubits. We put together a dream team from around the world. Uh, there are at least three people on this team that will almost definitely get the Nobel Prize once we have the final, you know, Myronic Cupid created. As in, we have to show, you can't say proof, by the way. I've been slapped around by experimentalists. <laughs> so you can tell you that there is no uh, competing argument and all evidence points in the direction of the thing you're saying. You know, at this point, every theorist says, yes, you have Myronas, you're done. Experimentalists, not so much. So we have smoking guns that we're waiting, and it's I'm waiting for the call. It could be any any minute is what I'm really believing. Um, and I work in the labs mostly. So these days, I'm actually down in the hardware working in the labs. That was the backdrop for that video was basically my lab that they were taking all the pictures in. Um, but it's a great team from around the world. Um, there's a bunch of links. Um, I really wouldn't worry about writing them down um, because 
A, we've got them recorded, we have them available, but more importantly, there's only one link you really need, and that's Microsoft.com slash quantum. That's it. That's easy to remember. And all the others can, are findable from there. So that's, I think, where I'm going to stop, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So uh, I remember you mentioned that you are trying to keep the qubits from uh, heating up with mm -hmm. the and the, uh, the basically any kind of uh, external mm -hmm. um, radiation. Radiation, yes. Yep. I was wondering uh, if uh, if you are doing something to prevent acoustic vibrations. Yes. Um, or is it, is it anything? Oh special? no, it's extremely important. So the building I was given for this, of course, it's my fault because I actually own the space. So they said you use it. Um, is a building where the second floor that I'm on is not load bearing. So the, the building actually is supported by the roof. It's called the tilt up building. And then the floor on the second floor, you put holes anywhere. Well, that also makes it flexible. It's going like this all the time. It's vibrating. In fact, there's a 30 hertz vibration that's a standing wave in this thing. And when I first put the fridges in, I couldn't get down to temperature, no matter what I did. So now we have active springs these are in, in um, gantries where they're hanging from active springs that are counteracting all the vibration in the room and yes now i'm at the right temperatures everything works it's good but vibration is a major problem for instance we never build a lab near a train line or right next to the highway or you know, on and on and on um so vibration is very important um thermal noise we know how to handle a lot but things like magnetic fields, we do lots of stuff in magnetic fields. Earth's magnetic field affects our devices. So for instance, let's say you have a loop. One of these devices happens to be a loop. It has what's called Josephson junctions on either side. It's called a squid, a quantum interference device. Uh, not the S's, that's weird. Anyway, and you have a loop going here, but any magnetic field coming through that changes the loop because it's actually storing magnetic energy called flux quantum in here. Well, there's a trick. Instead of making the loop like that, make it like that, as in put a figure eight. Now as the magnetic field comes in on one side, it's the opposite by 90 degrees or 180 degrees on the other side, and they cancel. So there are all sorts of things you can do for environmental environments, but things like that that you have to fix so that you can get this thing as unperturbed as possible. Uh, so you have shown how to pass information using quantum metal movement, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a no communication theorem, mm -hmm. which says this is kind of impossible, or uh, no. I don't understand this. No, no, remember, I, I still needed the classical information at the end to decode it. Uh -huh. So it doesn't break Shannon information theory or any of the other stuff at all. It's the fact, though, that, so think of it this way. Let's have a chip that's a quantum chip. And I need to communicate. Like we, when I build a normal IC, I have buses, I have ways of getting wires across the chip. I don't need wires. Instead, I can send a qubit state across the chip and leave it there. And when I want to communicate between these two, I can go change it here, it changed there. That's awesome. I now don't have, I, I need to set that up. But, and remember, I still have to do the same work, but now I can delay when this happens, I can pick and choose when I have no congestion to send a state somewhere that happens to be idle. So later I can use it when it is congested. And now everyone can talk at once. Say, but I still need the classical information. But that comes off the chip and back down, so it's in the third dimension. So I didn't have to pay for it on the chip. I don't have to worry about putting in wiring lanes and other things that I need. It's one example. The other thing is cryptography. So it's no better communication. Again, it doesn't break information theory at all. But if, let's say, I've got a, a fiber optic line between New York and LA, and I can send entangled qubits across, I can send quantum information photonically. I'll use photons for this. Well, what that means is when I send the information from here to here, no one can eavesdrop. Because if you measure it, it destroys it. And you don't have the classical information to decode it. So now you have a completely secure channel for as long as you want. This is also the experiment that both the Chinese and the Canadians have done with satellites where you send photons, entangled photons, off to a satellite or bounce them off of an aircraft and bring them down, and you can do fully encrypted communications that nobody can eavesdrop on because it just destroys it. Neither, none of you will get the information if they actually try to measure it. So there are things like that that are really nice and interesting, but it doesn't, like I said, everything in information theory is still correct. 
and nothing here broke that. Um, yep. I have a question about the three-way quantum computer. Sure. Is it actually production ready? Because it takes <coughs> like 3,000 or 3,000 qubits? Yes. Now, again, it depends on your definition of terms. Okay? So first of all, is the quantum computer? No. It's a quantum annealer. So this is the equivalent of, in the 1940s, we had analog computers. It is actually an analog quantum computer. What I put up were all digital quantum computers. So first thing is, yes, you can always build analog machines earlier and quicker for lots of reasons, but they don't scale. You have this problem of eventually the digital will take over and emulate everything analog does, which is actually what the quantum chemistry is doing, for example. Um, that's the first problem, but they get there first. They could be 10, 15 years ahead of everybody else because of that. Second problem, I said their qubits only last 10 nanoseconds. That's barely enough to show that they are quantum, that there is a quantum effect. Now, we actually have a couple papers out. We actually ran a million examples on D-Wave machines and a million examples simulated in the cloud and then showed that, yes, there is a quantum effect. It's measurable, but I can actually compute better on just get some machines on Azure, do the same algorithm, quantum emulation of it, and I can actually go faster and get a better fidelity answer because they have all the noise that analog is, is inherent to and we don't. So you can't do anything real world with it, I'm sorry. But it is a great test bed. Having a couple thousand qubits, no matter how bad they are, is really interesting. There are things you can try, things you play with. And what makes it an annealer as opposed to this, there are no gates. What you do, in effect, you wire it up. You hook up the qubits. You initialize them all to the values and then walk away. And everything that cools down, you're annealing. You cool everything down and everything will freeze out. Everything's spinning around, you freeze out and then you read the answer off. So it's just like an analog machine. Wire it up, walk away, come back, read all the gauges. It's interesting, but it doesn't solve anything for you other than for people who want to have, you know, say they have a quantum machine. Okay. Um, by the way, this is a small community. We're all actually friends. I know that those guys are some really good people. Some of the technology is awesome that they've got. Um, but it's not what I want to build for a quantum computer. So what was the max number of qubit can be simulated at this point? Um, locally or in the cloud? Cloud. It, it depends who you ask. Yeah. But the number is in the low 40s. 42 to 45, depending whose numbers you're willing to use. For instance, there was a group in Switzerland that did a you know, 44, 45 once. And all the machines they had to keep them up long enough and they had to, you know, and what they computed was not that impressive, but it did work. We've done low, we're not, I'm not allowed to quote numbers because we don't want to be in that war, right? But I've got a machine that, you know, I can do it on Azure. I get low 40s. I can do, you know, um, material simulations with low 40s and get the right answers and everything works and distribute over. And I need thousands of machines to do it, by the way. This isn't, oh, a few machines in a cluster. And I need a ridiculous amount of memory. So the biggest machines on Azure, about a thousand of them I had to borrow to do this. But, yeah, we can do it too. But what's the point? Other than to show, yes, I can write a simulator that's really efficient, sure. So but you're not going to solve any real problems. So you mentioned that your MacBook Pro can actually have maybe about 30 qubits, right? Yeah, no problem. That's easy. Just the extra minutes of memory. Everyone you add doubles the memory, doubles the time. So I've done 32 qubits with a 64 gigabit, gig, gigabyte machine, main memory machine. The other thing is distribution doesn't help you because it's linear algebra. Everything has to talk to everything. So you really need parallel processing, not distributed. So for instance, I have a couple machines with four terabytes of main memory and 80 compute cores on them. And I still can only go into the 30s, you know, in terms of the number of qubits. If, you know, you're going to buy a couple of extra qubits, it's not worth it. I've been able to prove any algorithm with around 20, 22, and that's fast and that's easy. So QDK will do all of that. You can download it, it's free, run it on your machine, no problem. Yeah. So I wanted to dig into this computing a molecule thing. Yep. Um, I'm hoping you're more familiar with this paper than I am, but in May, mm -hmm. uh, MIT released that they can synthesize uh, pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. just as well as an organic chemist could. Yep. So are you just talking about structure of these molecules, or are you mm -hmm. also talking about synthesis? Well, the, 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 that group, um, Ilan Ospravusic, his mm -hmm. team, um, and Ilan's a good friend, by the way. Um, 
you, you, you hit the key word, organic. That's in the first two lines okay. of, of the periodic table. Yes, they can do well, that. And pharmaceuticals, you're just talking about a small portion is active. Yes, so. you only talk about the active site, and what you're really trying to do is docking energies. Okay. So what you're trying to do is figure out, so we have big classical, by the way, when I say I'm going to do nitrogenase or, or any of this stuff, you're not going to do the molecule. That's not really what you're doing. You're going to build a normal, are you a chemistry person at all? I am. Okay, so you're going to do a DFT model, you do density, density functional theory model, which is the best technique we have for this on big classroom machines. But you have to come up with a function, and you don't know if it's right. There's no way to validate it. We can do validation on the quantum side. So the idea is we plug it in, you give us things, we vary it, we tell you one that's correct, hand it back to you, and you still run the DFT calculations. But in the end, now you believe something. As opposed to, no, now we go to synthesize it in the lab and see if we really believe, because we made up this, this, um, this ansatz that we're not so sure about, right? So that's really what this is about, is I'm going to not put the classical quantum chemistry people out of business. I'm going to help them. I view quantum as a coprocessor, just like a GPU. It sits in the cloud. You send to it the kernel of things that you really can't do or really hard to do in the classical side, but quantum happens to be good at. We leave everything else classical because it's too hard to do everything quantum. It's not worth it. It's not good at it. So it doesn't replace anything classical. It supplant, supplants, sub, supplements it, sorry, instead. And if you view it that way, then there's all sorts of things to solve. All sorts. So if I want force field models, better force field models for molecule docking, perfect. I can validate a very small area, very small, but I can tell you the right force fields. And today you have to guess at and that's really the problem. So Alon is perfectly right, and he does beautiful, and he is an organic chemist, actually, by training. And his team is great, and a lot of his people now have gone to Google, and they're doing great chemical work there. They're trying to figure out things they can do on, on the stuff they put together. Um, and like I said, you know, we know each other. I don't have anything against anybody. It's more of, on the hardware bottom level, we're trying to make something that is scalable. If we do, everyone else will do it, too. You know, I think maybe we have a two-year lead from the time we prove it works to time everyone else, and they've all said they're going to switch, which is I think we don't have more than two years for everyone else to do the same. Because if you find something that will scale to a million qubits, uh, that's what you're going to do. In the meantime, they'll all do 50, 70 qubits, and they'll prove quantum supremacy, <coughs> and then they don't know what to do after that. That's probably the problem. By the way, Alon also is working on organic batteries. One of his main areas is how do I get better batteries? And that's where I got that example from, is from him. Oh, cool. How do you measure a qubit? What does that involve? Um, okay, so think of it this way. Let's say we've got um, the qubit state we're going to use uh, is readable as a frequency. It's an, an energy is frequency, and they're all the same thing. You can heat it, and they're all one thing. But we're going to think of it like a frequency. So it's vibrating there, or it, it has a certain energy level. That if I put it in a circuit, so I have a big inductor and a capacitor, the inductor and capacitor have a frequency they're naturally at, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm going to use the qubit as the capacitor, if you will. This capacitance in the whole system is actually quantum capacitance. And I have an inductor, and now I'm going to put a frequency <clears> into <throat> that loop. So the loop sits there, and he has a resonant frequency. If the qubit's a zero, it'll be at that frequency. If the qubit's a one, it's going to shift the capacitance, and it's go off, and you won't get your signal back. So I probe it with the signal. Signal comes back. It was a zero. It doesn't come back. It's a one. It's that simple. Now, there's all sorts of things I'm, I'm waiting for. Right? Okay. But that's really what you're doing. Okay. Um, in case of photonics, you read the polarization. You put it through a filter. Did I get a signal or did they're all? Did I get the signal or did not? It's all they are. Because you can only get zero or one. Now, when you do that, you collapse it to that signal also. So A, it's now a zero or a one. And you've got to rebuild it if you want it to go back to being something quantum. Uh, or something not known as zero or one. And the other problem is, what if it wasn't zero or one? It has some probability of being zero or probability of being one. You measured as a zero. It's now a zero. But what if the probability was really over here somewhere, but you got a zero? So now you want to repeat the experiment many times. How often do you have to sample? Well, if you look at just naive information theory, you have to square the number of samples for the accuracy you want. So if I want one-tenth accuracy, I've got to sample it 100 times. 1.001, 1 I've got to do 10 to the minus fifth sample, fourth samples. Um, but there are better algorithms than that. So that's naive sampling. There's something called phase estimation, 
which actually is quadratically better than that. And so now you start getting down to things where you can actually get these energies for these molecules out and not have to run it billions of times to get high accuracy. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, if the, or you are rather working on something that would be that would uh, input and output quantum states. Yes. Yeah. Well, think of it this way. There's two ways of getting data into the machine. One way is classically, where I'm just loading in the qubits, and then I do gates to move it around, put more in, put more. The other is I build what's called an oracle. So an oracle is something I start classical, but I build a quantum state up, and when the machine needs it, it's already in qubits quantumly to be used. Okay? Well, think about a side quantum computer that did this. Um, this actually comes from um, Seth Lloyd as an example. Uh, for something called QRAM, quantum random access memory. We actually take a whole bunch of classical RAM and then compress it all down into qubit states, and that becomes an oracle. The problem is, once you read it, it's gone, and you've got to do it again, and you need exponential classical hardware to make the qubits. That's a problem, obviously. However, let's say I'm doing something like chemistry or materials where I know what the data should look like. I have the Hamiltonian. I have the equations for it. I can make a circuit that generates the data in superposition. So the input is self-generated. So for example, I set up a circuit that replaces the Hamiltonian, but I put the initial electrons in as my classical input, which are, in this case, say bits. It's a Fox state or something like that that I'll pop in. So now I say there's an electron spin up here, a spin down here, there's an electron here and here. I run it through, and what comes out the other end is what the molecule would have done to it. And so the actual circuit is the representation of the real data. All the interactions between all the orbitals, all of that stuff doesn't get loaded as data. It's the circuit that's running, that manipulates it. So there are, there are ways of trading that off, but there are systems also, for instance, quantum machine learning that learns quantum states. If I want to tune a quantum system, I might want to do machine learning that's purely quantum. The input and the output are quantum. I don't measure it but it runs to get itself into the right place through machine learning. Um, yeah, the, the example is actually one of those that I was thinking, but uh, the idea that I had in mind is basically up to quantum computers mm -hmm. that operate in different states. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned that they did the photon transmission of the mm -hmm. photons. So yep. Those two exchange photons they can. Yep. through any hardware that you already have or work on. You can use the dark fiber that's all over this country. Fiber optics works fine for that. I so, can I can convert my qubits to photons, okay. entangle that, that them, send them through. That, that was basically what I was yeah, you can okay. and then back. To it. Yeah, and okay. then back. And now you've been able. That's how you move quantum information without having to measure it. Yep. This is a point of clarification. Yep. Uh, I mean, today's supercomputers. I mean, would you call them classical? Yeah. Right all, all everything is classical. Everything is classical. So yep. tomorrow, yep. in this quantum this mm -hmm. reality. Would tomorrow's supercomputers be a combination of classical and quantum yep. strung together? Is that the Think of it as just adding a GPU to the supercomputer. Okay, All it really is is it's a coprocessor that does some things really well and then nothing else well. And those some things you're going to offload onto the quantum computer. So for instance, we have designs for Azure for the data centers where we have the data center and we have the quantum machines and then how, what are the buses, what are the connections, how does that all work so that seamlessly you know, libraries are running on the quantum computer in effect. So when you just do a call and the right thing happens. So along the same lines, then could you string multiple quantum computers to scale up or are we yes. just a single? No, you can you can have multiple quantum computers. Again, we have this problem of distribution of state between them. But for instance, let's have to sample. We we said, you know, no matter what, I'm getting ones and zeros out and I really want to get more information. Put a thousand quantum computers in parallel like I would a cluster for classical, I'm doing a thousand samples in every row. So I just went a thousand times faster. I can live with that. Okay? Things like there are reasons to do the parallelization, but hooking them to each other quantumly almost doesn't pay in one respect. It's better to do them as separate as sampling items because you have to sample anyway. So I could have a classical computer, you know, drive different. Oh yeah, machines. that's easy. That's easy. Yes, definitely, definitely. Now we didn't talk about error correction. I mean, there's all sorts of things that didn't come up here. I still have to do error correction. Ours is easier than they have to do, but we still have to do it. That takes a lot of classical computing. And it has to be in real time while the algorithm's going on. So now you need very tight binding between the classical machine and the quantum machine. 
So we actually are building cryogenic classical machines, things that run at four Kelvin, classical algorithms. So I want a classical CPU down extremely close to the quantum plane because I have this tight loop. I can't run any faster than I can fix the errors that are happening. And so we have a whole effort in just that, which is just doing, like I said, classical computing, but really cold and really fast. Yep. Sorry. Uh, another question I had is, so I'm just curious about the way you made the pseudo Majorana terminals. Mm -hmm. Is uh, if you make a string based on like with the electrons mm -hmm. tied to each other, um, don't you get the problem that uh, because of the length of the string, you now have the larger surface to be exposed to external uh, Yes and no. The yes is you'd expect that. However, uh, well, first of all, the Majorana is wearing their own antiparticles. So you've yeah, got to get them far them. apart because if they're not far apart, they'll, let, they'll destroy each other. So you need a certain length. So on the order of a minimum of about a micron and then maybe up to two or three microns is really how far apart you want. But that's like, big. That's yeah. big. That's billions of electrons in there. Okay, at least millions, but I haven't done the math recently. Um, and our state really is whether there's an even or an odd number of electrons. That's our state, our zero or one, is really what the, with the Majorana is what you wind up with. So if a stray electron gets onto that wire, you've destroyed your state. So you're completely correct. However, we're able to build these qubits so the wire has a very high charging energy compared to everything else around it. Charging energy is how hard is it to get an electron on or get one off. And we can isolate it so the probabilities go ridiculously small that anything will come on. Basically, we're fixing parity. And parity is a lot easier to fix than decoherence. So we have all sorts of ways of, of making sure the parity stays right. And I only have to last for seconds or minutes. Seconds is even is enough instead of microseconds. Now I only need 20 qubits to make one that stays alive forever. That's great. So those are the types of things that, yes, we do those trade-offs all the time. In the lab, we don't do that. And sure, they die pretty quickly, but they're supposed to. We understand that. It's first, can you just prove that they're there and they work? We talk about the paint and uh, yep. you know, on the fertilizers thing. It's really interesting. Can you just go over what is blocking you from doing that right now? And then um, is there just any other cool things that... So let's, let's stick with the fertilizers. Most has been done on that. Okay, mm -hmm. so the ethimoco or the nitrogenase. We can make synthetic nitrogenase. The, quantum, the chemists have been working on this on classical machines for 30 years. Okay? The top guy is probably Marcus Ryer at ETH Zurich. Right? I work with him. The problem is what they've been able to make, first of all, the bacteria that's in the root of plants is anaerobic. It will not work in the presence of oxygen because of the irons. It oxidizes and everything goes boom. So we need a process we can do in atmosphere because again, you want it cheap, you want an industrial process, if it's anaerobic, we got a problem. So that's the first thing. So they made molecules, they do work, but after about the fifth or sixth time that they crack the nitrogen, they fall apart. As opposed to, I don't know if it's millions or billions of times, you know, this little molecule will work. And the reason we can't analyze how it works, that's what's blocking us. We want to be able to look at this thing and play with it change things, do things, and figure out how it works and what we can make that will do the things we want, like being in atmosphere when it works and surviving many runs. And as soon as you see these DNF orbitals in the molecule, you can't do it classically. It's just beyond uh, our capabilities. And that's kind of, the, and the same thing, the, paint, the carbon capture is the same sort of thing. By the way, there's another thing called CRUD, uh, the Copper River Un- identified deposits, or unknown deposits, happens in nuclear reactors from the Copper River nuclear reactor, that it's basically rust that, that goes on these, these fuel rods. And we know there are ways to attract that and get rid of it, but we can't do the um, analysis. I'm trying to remember the material. I don't remember if it's chromium or whatever that we need, but we can't analyze it. So we can't build the specific thing we need we could, you know, basically make these power plants that could last forever, be self-cleaning, and all the rest of that. That would be awesome. So like I said, this whole list of things, and they're all about things that have heavy metals in them. As soon as the metals are in them, you're kind of toast. Sure. So when you threw that picture of the team, and mm -hmm. you said maybe three Nobels mm -hmm. in there, 
there's only been what three women in mm -hmm. physics awarded yes. the, the Nobel, and you had a, almost a third of women yes. up on that page. That's yeah. really exciting, especially since just in this room there's maybe a fifth mm -hmm. women. Mm -hmm. Is that across the board for Microsoft and in uh, other companies? As I well? don't Microsoft? know what our numbers are in, in physics or in everything. Specifically in, in physics, chemistry. chemistry. I, okay, our labs have a very high ratio of women, actually. Our PhD students that we sponsor and a lot of postdocs we have are women, and we have actually at least two or three women running good chunks of the lab. Um, our whole quantum software effort is run by Krista Savori, who was in the opening video and is in the picture at the end. Um, so I'm not worried. I mean, we do. And by the way, every hire, I go through diversity. You know, I've got to go through a checklist of who and how and how many do we have and who are this. And we make we're very serious about it that we make sure we do the right thing. Um, the Nobel size of it, to be honest, um, the three that are on there are men because they're the ones who did that original work. Okay, um, Michael Friedman is one of them. Shankar Dasarma, who heads the University of Maryland Physics Department, and Roman Luchin, who's probably our lead. Um, a mathematician at Santa Barbara with Michael. Those three were on the original paper, did the original work. Um, on the other hand, Leo Kuvenhoven did that 2012 science first demonstration of Majorana's. There's another set of pasta. So I don't know where things have come in, but the more, more recent stuff, there are a lot of women on the first authors on the papers. Um, and in fact, Angela Koo, who's at Delft, has a device that's going cold today. She's been working on it for six months, and if it works, we get our Cuban. And she will get the credit for it, guaranteed. She's the person who's been pushing for this from the beginning. So there's, I don't see barriers in these types of labs. It's people who are passionate about it and the people that are there, and that's about it. And so I'm pretty happy about the environment. When I, at Microsoft, I've spent my entire career mentoring only women. Well, they get the worst deal, they, and especially 30 years ago. It was really bad. But they need the most to how to play the game, how to get in there, how to get improvement, how to get you know ahead. And so I've always dedicated myself to that. And I think it's paid off. We've had a lot of senior female employees, uh, you know, managers in the company across. Um, and we have and we have every ethnicity you can think of and every um, orientation you can think of, and on and on and on. I'm just thinking of my group. It's it's quite an interesting. Mm -hmm. David, are you doing any work in um, like hackathons to help develop algorithms? For... Yes. Um, the katas you saw yeah. come from Maria. She used to be a major competitor in coding contests, okay. hackathons. In fact, she's known, I think, worldwide for some yeah. of her coding skills. And now she's doing it for quantum. Okay. So she's taken this on as her banner. And cool. so you saw the picture with the, the community one. She was in the center of that picture, and she's running all these events. And yeah. yes, there's another coding contest coming. I was going to announce it tonight, but we didn't get the legal okay yet. And so yeah, I got to wait. Pass that on. That but, oh yeah, I would. There's be a lot of people here. But there's a lot of that stuff that we do all the time. Yeah. We yeah. also ran a quantum challenge, um, where we gave uh, I think Xboxes away or something for that one. But people came up with new go. algorithms <laughs> that surprised the hell out of me. Never thought of it. Yeah. Huh? So, yeah, we could do it with this group. Yes, we could. <laughs> um, but it's that type of thing where we're very committed to. I also, I've had two or three interns that are high school students in, in this area. Uh, we, we, you're good, you're interested, come on in, we'll do stuff. So, yeah. With your systems, how many people would you say that you would need to achieve quantum supremacy? Okay, so let me explain the term first for people who don't know it. Right? So. And I, you can thank John Preskill for the term, which is one of the worst, you know, I would, I would have used something other than quantum supremacy. Okay. <laughs> He's a nice guy. He has nothing to do with that. He never thought of it. It's okay. Um, can you compute something on a quantum computer that you can't compute on a classical machine? That's quantum supremacy. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be useful. It just has to be provable that it's something you can't do in any reasonable length of time on a classical machine that you can do on a quantum machine. So if you think about it, if you have qubits and you do some circuit that you don't know what's in that circuit, it's a black box, and it comes out with some distribution you sample from it, it's virtually impossible for a classical machine to figure out what generated that data to come up with the same sample. And it's a sam so it's a sampling problem. You can prove this is from Scott Aronson, who is at Harvard, who's now at 
University of Texas. Um, this is his problem that he came up with that with a very small number of qubits, you need maybe 20, 30, and a very short circuit, maybe 10 or 15 depth gates. Well, Even these really bad qubits can do that. That limit of simulation, okay, now the classic machine can't do it. So they're all shooting for about 50 qubits, 50 to 70. Okay, I think Google's going, well, they did a 49 they're working on. Uh, in, IBM has a 75 qubit they're trying to pull together. Trying to get that many qubits all working and runnable for this is the hard part. And once they get that, yes, you'll have quantum supremacy. My guess is one to two years. It was, should have been this, it was supposed to have been this year. People found out how hard it really was. But it's a problem that it's, it's a solution to something nobody wants, nobody cares about. It's a mathematical thing. You've shown, you've computed this distribution that you can't compute classically. But you did do something you can't do classically. So that's okay. Once, we, once we've achieved that state, do you mm -hmm. predict that there's going to be just a huge influx of developers and, and work on nope. that? Do because there's, it doesn't do it. it, it doesn't advance the state of the art. All it did was show, I can build 49 qubits. There's still 49 qubits that have error rates of about 10 to the minus third or 10 to the minus second for a two qubit gate. I can't even build an error correction code for that. When you said 10,000 qubits, that's when you're above the threshold that you can actually have good enough qubits. Those qubits aren't there yet, okay? So when I finally get to that level, then I need tens of thousands of them to do one good qubit. You're not gonna get developers until I solve real problems. And I can't solve real problems with any of it. Now, let me back off. I can do things that are called variational approaches. That the LAN is really good at this stuff. So variational techniques, where you do a little bit of the algorithm quantumly, and you do little bits and bits and bits, and you add them all up. That will work, but it's quadratically worse. So now, how far do you go before that takes too much time versus just doing it classically, which is quadratically slower than what you started with? There's this whole trade-off. There may be one or two niches where variation algorithms will actually pay off. If nothing else, we will do them to start with because you only need physical qubits. And you can say, look, I can get the ground state of water in 14 qubits. I know I can do that, no problem. And it'll take me, you know, a couple minutes, okay, maybe an hour. Of course, classically, I can do that in a microsecond, the same algorithm. But it proves the qubits work, and that's worth doing. But I don't see this giant influx of programmers. This is more of learning a new style of thinking, which even helps you classically. There's lots of things I've now solved classically because I think things now from a quantum point of view. And it's also for the future. This is coming. It's just a question of when. I'm hoping it's within my career lifetime, but I got two great grandchildren already, so we'll see. You know, we'll see if it makes it. Yeah. How do you debug in Q sharp? <laughs> <laughs> Q sharp is not so bad because you have a simulator. And you can debug with the simulator because you can. We it's classical. You can look inside the qubit. I thought you could ask how to debug on a quantum machine. That's much harder. Um, it actually there are techniques known as tomography that lets you figure out the state of the machine, what's happening. So you stop it, measure out, and figure out where you were. And you have to sample n times to do it. So we are building quantum debugging techniques for the hardware right now. We're doing the quantum debugging for Visual Studio for the simulators. That's fairly straightforward. And that we teach you, like in the cottons and different places, how to do. You can actually dump the whole state vector out. You want to see the whole, you know, all the complex values and how they go together in the phases. And you want to party on, you can do it. But you can also single step through it. All of that works. The standard Visual Studio debugger works and VS Code. And then how do you do performance and stress testing? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually non trivial. Um, first reason, no, first thing is, uh, as I said, there's tomography. That's really, you use one com quantum computer to test another. So the way you know if this one's working is you test it against the other, you know, um, with standard tomography techniques. That, that you can do. But it's statistical. So you've got this problem of you can't run it, like ru you run your tests, you know, when, when you finish building your code, and if they run past all the tests at the end, you win. Well, how do you test it when you get different answers every time you run it? Now you've got to run it millions of times and see, and is the error rates where you expect them to be? And what if you have correlated errors across qubits across the machine because of entanglement? You can't just say, oh, these two wires are touching. Now you've got qubits that aren't even near each other affecting each other. It's an open <clears throat> issue. 
sorry. I mean, just, and, and by the way, I'll be happy to have that problem because it means I have real quantum computers to run on and that things I have to worry about. So I'll be happy to have the problem. <laughs>